booktube how's it going um today we're going to be talking about um a book written by one of my favorite wrestlers ever who died over the summer um this book is called kamala speaks um this book is so good um and james harris uh, the man behind the paint um, is just the sweetest man who ever lived, I think. Um, I could be horribly wrong about that, but <clears throat> when you read his story, it is just um, like you just want to give him a hug the whole time. Um, basically, um, he grew up... Um, very poor, and then um, had to go to Florida um, to run from the law when um, it was one of those uh, you got to get out of town before sundown kind of things, or else. Um, and he was just a good kid trying to make it through life kind of thing. And um, he happened to start going to wrestling shows in Florida and just thought it was so much fun. And then later when he was living in Michigan, his, um, sister's husband told him like, dude, you're like six foot eight, you know, like you're huge. Like you should definitely get into wrestling. And he's like, well, I don't even know how I would do that. And he's like, well, I know some people. And it turns out, um, one of the people he knew was Bobo Brazil. And so he started training. Um, and like a lot of these people who started in the seventies and eighties, um, you start not knowing that it's a work. And so he didn't know. And, um, one of these nights they went and, um, it was Bobo Brazil, I believe versus the Sheik and he was sitting in the front row and the Sheik was just doing some dastardly stuff like the Sheik does and he wanted to get up and he started seeing Bobo bleeding and he's like oh man I gotta help him I gotta save my friend and um, after the match he tried to like like help him to the back and he saw the Sheik coming and um the Sheik was just walking because, like, the show was over. They were already out of where the crowd is. Yeah. And um, he goes to, like, tell Bobo, look out, the Sheik's coming. And when the Sheik saw um, James Harris's eyes look at him, he knew that he didn't know it was a work. So he came charging at him, like, with a razor or something like that. And, um... James took off and he felt really bad. He's like, I'm sorry I left you. I just didn't know what to do. That man was coming. And, um, so when he started, he was, um, sugar bear Harris for the most part. Um, and then, um, he started working with Percy Pringle as his manager and he was in a relationship with this girl and she didn't like watching him getting beat on TV. And she thought he was a loser. And then Percy Pringle in their angle. Um, if you don't know who Percy Pringle is, he's Paul Bearer. Um, the guy who came out with Undertaker. Um, Percy Pringle started like whipping him. And like after matches when he would lose and like yell at him and all this stuff. And then he would go home and his wife would pull out a gun and like shoot towards the door, like get the fuck out of here. I don't want your losing ass coming in here. You let that white man talk to you like that and do those things to you on TV. I'm so embarrassed. And so he would like get a bunch of shit for it. And so he would go and he would talk to the bookers and just go, Hey, can I like do something just so, you know, my, old lady doesn't like get mad at me and he, he would like sleep in fields because he was afraid to go home after the shows and so they're like okay um we'll let you win the battle royal 
And so he goes home and he tells his lady, he's like, look, I'm going to win the battle royal. Or no, he didn't say I'm going to win. He's like, um, there's a battle royal and I'm going to, and the winner gets like um, $1,000 or something like that. And um, she's like, you better win. And so she brings all her friends to the arena and he wins the battle royal and she just loses her mind so happy. They go back home. Um, she starts preparing this big party. She's going to have all of her friends there. And, um, so he goes in the back and he's like, okay, like, where's my thousand bucks? And they're like, dude, it's a work. There's no thousand dollars. Like, here's your 20 bucks for wrestling tonight or whatever. And he's like, shit, like, how am I going to do this? And he goes home and, um, she's like, let me see the money. I want to see the money. And, um, he tells her there is no money and she pulled her shotgun out again and shot at him and he went running and never went back so um these are just like fun little stories about him and there's so many and he ended up doing i don't want to ruin the book for you because there's so much that he did that was just awesome like going um wrestling in africa wrestling in germany wrestling in the uk um and then he ended up breaking his leg in Africa, I think. Yeah, he broke his leg in Africa. Um, got sent home to the States. And um, his leg was kind of healing. And he went to Memphis to talk to someone he knew there. To see if he could find any work. And um, Jerry Jarrett and Jerry Lawler saw him. And they're like, oh man... Like, um, we got an idea, blah, 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 based on a Frank Frazetta painting, um, which is awesome. If I find the painting, I'll put it in right here. And they're like, we want you to be the Ugandan cannibal, the Ugandan giant. And, um, like, you don't know, like how to speak you don't know anything you have a handler and he has to tell you what to do throughout the match and um we're gonna put you in an angle for the title with jerry lawler and he's like okay that sounds good and um jerry jerry lawler was the one who came up with the face paint and all the stuff off of the painting and um so for a long time kamala didn't even know how to paint himself he had to like learn later how to do it after he left Memphis, but they ended up putting the belt on him. He beat Lawler and it was like printing money in Memphis. Like this monster heel comes in and just decimates our hero. And now the rest of the summer is going to be Lawler trying to get his title back. It's just brilliant booking, brilliant stuff. And, um, but Jerry was like, look, I want to do this, but if you feel like this is, like, wrong, like, morally, like, we won't do it. You know, it's, like, not that big of a deal, you know, just we don't want to do anything to you that you're not happy with. And he was like, if you're paying me, he's like, I'm just acting. This is an acting gig. Um, if you're paying me, if you're allowing me to provide for my family, put food on my table, um, I'll, I'll do whatever you want to do, you know? And over the years, um, he says in the book that he's gotten a lot of heat from other black people outside of the business who look at what he's doing as, um, just wrong. Like he shouldn't have been doing it. And, um, he was just like, I grew up poor without anything. And if wrestling gives me a way to do what I love to do, he's like, I'm just acting, you know, like people in movies who are drug dealers aren't really drug dealers. People in movies who are prostitutes aren't really prostitutes. And he's like, and I'm not from Uganda, you know? So like, what's the big deal here? Like, this is good. Um, but man, Kamala scared me to death as a kid. One of his biggest feuds, um, when he was in mid South was with Andre the giant. And, um, there's a lot of myth behind what went on with him and Andre. 
and basically, um, Andre or Kamala felt that Andre was taking some liberties with him in the ring that he shouldn't have been taken. So Kamala kind of gave him what for and, um, put him on the floor, like on the mat. And that was kind of, you didn't do that. And, um, <clears throat> Andre called him a name that he didn't like. So, um, the next night, um, he brought a gun with him and he told Andre, like, if he ever did anything like that again, um, you know, what, what, and Andre's like, oh, sorry, boss, and the whole thing, and <clears throat> he was so freaked out that he thought Andre was gonna try to kill him in a match or something like that, like, just start strangling him or something, that he had the girl he was with at the time sew a pocket into the back of his, um, tights that he had on under his, loincloth deal and in that pocket he kept like a little 22 gun and he wrestled like that for a little bit and then said falling on it like when he would get thrown down hurt so bad that he just ended up having to like not do that anymore but um him and andre ended up getting along really good andre um, got him his job at WWF. Um, Andre let Kamala slam him before Hogan slammed him. Um, there were only a few people. Um, I think Stan Hansen and, um, I don't know. Might, I don't think it was Baba. Might've been Baba. I can't remember. Um, or maybe it was Anoki. I don't I can't remember off the top of my head, but, um, so that was like a big respect thing. And I think more than anything, what Andre's problem with Kamala was, was that um, he was billed as the Ugandan giant. And to Andre, Andre was the only giant. And nobody took that moniker from him. You know, like... Um, and at the end of the day, that wasn't even really... James Harris's fault like that was just the name he was given um but they ended up being pretty close after the debacle happened like brilliant stuff and then even when he went to WWF and um they turned him face which they should never have done but they did it he was so instantly likable like, you just felt for him the second, like, I think it was with Papa Shango. Like, that was the, was it? Was that the angle? Can't remember if that was the angle or not. That might be off a little bit. But, um, they did all these skits where Slick, um, the manager was trying to, like, teach him how to, like, enter society, and, like, he would take him bowling, and they would do these little vignettes where he's trying to explain, um, the world to him and everything. But, man, like, he was just so awesome. And, like, you might say, like, oh, but from a wrestling standpoint, he's pretty shit. He doesn't know how to do anything. Like, when he first was in Memphis, Lawler was like, all those wrestling moves you know, don't do them anymore. Because you didn't learn wrestling. You're the Ugandan cannibal. Like, you're going to hit me. I'm going to bleed. You're going to lick the blood off your hands. Like, um, this won't work if you know wrestling moves. So that was all part of his gimmick. And, you, and it's seriously probably one of, like, the best booked gimmicks of all time, and some people might go, well, The Undertaker. Well, The Undertaker had, like, a 30-year career, and um, you know, if you've been around, that during that whole 30-year career, he wasn't awesome all those 30 years. Like, there were, there were ebbs and flows, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, so, um, and then... The book goes into a lot of his diabetes and him losing his foot and then losing a leg and then having to lose the other leg 
and what that did to him um, emotionally and stuff. And the way the book is put together, I won't spoil this for you because it the book opens up like this. It is just so well done. And um, I know I throw around the term legend a lot, but if you think about it, there's been a lot of people in the wrestling business and there's not that many that are legends. So when I call somebody a legend, I mean it. And, um, I don't know, like, if you like wrestling, you have to get this book, like, um, and I think I said it, um, a while back, but I think you could still get signed copies of this, um, from his website, kamalaspeaks.com. Um, but yeah, he did die of COVID, um, over the summer and that broke me that like, I don't know why, like, that was just like, I never would have, like, if I would have, like, made a top five of, like, oh, when these wrestlers die, I'm going to lose my shit. Um, I don't think I ever would have put him on that list. But for some reason, man, um, it just really... <sighs> and uh, some other stuff that happens in this book that is kind of like an ongoing theme is... Um, how he dealt with racism in wrestling. Um, and not even just like, um, loud, angry racism, like stuff like, um, he wouldn't get as much money as someone else would get. Um, or, and it, he's like, and this is coming from like people that he, never looked at as racist people. It's just, this is how the business was. And, um, so he was really on the cusp of, um, really knocking that down and not even just in America, but in Japan too. Like, um, there was some different forms of racism going on in Japan when he was there. Um, it's just such an interesting book. He, he led such a great life. Um, so definitely pick this book up um, if you're into this kind of stuff. So see you later.